Good evening, everybody, and welcome back to the Wednesday webinar with the Property Law Alliance. Uh, it's so good to have you with us. It's so good to have Solna and Bruno with us. How are you guys doing? I'm going to start with Bruno today because I always start with Solna. Bruno, oh, wow. how's going? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I don't know what to say. That caught me completely by surprise. <laughs> no, I'm I'm really good. Thanks for asking, Chris. It's still it's still cold here, but um, things are getting back to normal. Everyone's kind of excited to get past um, you know these restrictions. We do need to stop being uh, be careful, like be careful with being complacent. So it's just like a little warning to everyone there. Just like be careful because then you could land up being the one um, that catches it. Although I have to, yeah, a lot of people in Gauteng have already caught it. So I think uh, to a greater degree, like the herd immunization up here is probably going like quite strong. So yeah, it's all good. I guess to summarize what you've said and what I heard is don't drink outside in other places, drink at home. So, okay, got that because the, 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 the ban has been lifted so we can drink at home. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to drink at home. So how are you doing? Nice. I'm good, thanks. I was equally surprised that you asked uh, Bruno first, but I'm very glad you did because now I can say thank you, Bruno, because I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but thanks for adding to the herd immunity since uh, you had COVID. And uh, we thought you had a very interesting uh, sniffly Nasal situation. Issue, yeah on last week's episode and I was worried before we started I said Brenda are you all right and you were like no man I'm cool and uh, so thank you for adding to the herd immunity I uh, I'm, uh, I I did the easy way out I just got a vaccine so no. uh, but thank you for actually catching COVID for us but I'm very happy you better and uh, you 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 know on this side of the conversation yeah, yeah, yeah so yay yeah, yeah. so I'm good thank, thank you Chris because Bruno is cool so I'm happy <laughs> <laughs> that's good we've got a jam-packed session today so let me get straight into the questions we've got a question interesting enough this was posed by somebody who I don't believe actually lives in South Africa uh, but there's still an interesting point to be made within this question and I think uh, it, it has relevancy or it's relevant to, to the South African context Question was asked by Stephen, and he says that um, he entered into a lease agreement for a period of time, but intends to move out before the lease expires. Per the lease agreement, subletting is permitted with written consent, so long as the person subleasing meets a certain set of requirements. The property manager, as he puts it, or in our case, the South African context, the, the managing agent says, subleasing is not permitted per the lease agreement, which according to Stephen is actually incorrect. Uh, Stephen wants to know, can the property manager slash managing agent deny my ability to sublease without providing just reasoning? Uh, I'm gonna start with Bruno. Is your vet pretty <laughs> nice. tonight? What did I, what did um, I do wrong? So, so <laughs> I'm just glad he's with us. He had COVID, I'm glad he's uh, I'm trying to use him. <laughs> 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 nice. Um, look, so, so, so the first place that you go, that people always look at is at, at the actual lease agreement itself, right? So that's vital. So they, um, they, I would just need to kind of clarify from the question whether the lease agreement actually provides for subletting or not. Uh, you know, whether the viewer is actually asking this from a hypothetical uh, context where it's like, does the law allow him to do it or not? Assuming, uh, but he made it sound like it was quite specific. So the lease agreement allows for subletting, provided that the person taking occupation or the tenant, the subtenant, uh, uh, complies with certain prerequisites, right? If that's the case, it's an express term of the lease agreement. So you go straight to the lease agreement and you try to figure out how the lease agreement is going to be interpreted. Now, what people don't realize is why lawyers have a job is if lawyers are able to actually draft these contracts ahead of time and we, we're able, so we're trained to think about numerous scenarios and how, oh, well, we're supposed to be trained about numerous scenarios and how they they, they'll play out. So we, we think two steps ahead. We try to cater for a draft into it. We study case law. We see issues that have occurred. We try to fix it and draft for it, right? And so in situations like this, you typically find that a lawyer, yes, would add an extra page where you'd have a whole bunch of prerequisites. But the reason for this is the more specific you are on what you intend to achieve, 
um, the easier it is to actually get to that result. So assuming that this lease agreement says something like, there's no issue with you subletting, but what we'd want is we'd want you to find a tenant that meets these requirements. So maybe it's credit record, a level of vetting, a, 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 like a, a prescribed way that you're going to vet, and more than likely also passing it over to the landlord for some level of consent. A lot of the leases would say something like, which won't be unreasonably withheld, which would then kind of put an onus on the landlord to say, well, if he's going to deny it, there's a specific reason why he's going to deny it. And provided that you've met these prerequisites, there really wouldn't be a reasonable reason why he would deny it, right? So this would actually kind of set the framework on how you would sublet, uh, who you would sublet to, and how you, you would gain the consent to sublet. And, you know, this kind of falls outside the ambit of the question, but what we also need to remember is when you're subletting, you're not escaping liability in terms of these agreements because you're not substituting the parties. Um, the reality is that you're still liable to the landlord for rent. So the landlord can still go after you. The main reason why one wants to control the subtenant is because you don't want somebody that's going to go in and it's going to destroy the place beyond what the deposit would actually be able to cater for and beyond what you'd be able to collect. Um, you don't want, even if you're a great tenant, if you destroy the place and you don't have 100000 to repair it, it's not going to matter. So the, the landlord wants to make sure that you don't put somebody in there that's capable of that level of destruction or damage. Um, and that's kind of why they control it. Short of that, typically landlords wouldn't really always mind because they've still got you to go after in case something does go wrong. No, oh, thanks, Bruno. Um, I think we can move over to the next question, which was asked by Debbie. Debbie says, we have an owner in a sectional title complex who refuses to repair the tap in his kitchen, in his kitchen sink, despite numerous letters from the managing agent. This has resulted in huge amounts of water being wasted and a huge account, which is now sitting at over 8,000 rand, she says. Uh, and, 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 and now what's happened is that she says every owner uh, within this complex has to now pay for this debt that has obviously arisen from the water which is being wasted. She says she wants to know, please can you advise what's the best way to address this situation? Um, Solna? Uh, I want to ask Bruno a question before I answer. Uh, uh, Bruno, the, the position um, around uh, Sectional Title Schemes Management Act um, the position around water to a unit, I mean, common property water, I'm very happy to, uh, to say, well, if there's a leak yeah. now on common property, mm -hmm. at least that falls within the body corporate's ability to manage. Mm -hmm. I mean, you fix the tap. But the fact that this owner um, is refusing to, to repair the tap in the unit, um, mm -hmm. I can't see any... Um, any reason um, why the body corporate can't then demand something like you need to fix this otherwise we're going to send somebody to fix it but just help me out the question that I wanted to ask is there's no requirement in terms of the sectional title schemes management act uh, with regards to, with regards to separate uh, meter uh, water meter readings am I right I'm not no, missing yeah. something no, yeah. no 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 you're absolutely right Brilliant. No, I just wanted to check that because uh, in my head, there, there can't be any legal requirement for a body corporate to have separate meter, uh, meter reading situation. So yeah. then you obviously take the schemes bill and you've divided in X amount of units. And I can see why the other owners are then getting upset with that. So I think the easiest answer here, and excuse me for my very not lawyery, but extremely pragmatic and practical approach to this would be the body corporate has to send a notice to this owner to say, Mr. Owner, you are liable for this, this account. But the problem that I'm seeing is um, if they don't take a practical approach to getting the problem fixed rather than trying to collect the money, if the units aren't built separately, there's no re legal requirement to be built se separately. How do we know exactly how much of the 8,000 rand we're talking about comes from that tap? How do we quantify 
the level of leak on that tap because in my mind um a leaking tap is one of those things that like drip 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 and maybe like stroky but the, um the, how do you quantify the loss on that so i would rather do something and i'm quite sure that the conduct rules would allow for something like this um to on on proper notice um tell the owner on this day we're sending a plumber he's gonna fix the problem and you're gonna get that invoice on your uh, levy statement obviously there has to be something at least in line with that from the conduct rules but honestly in my opinion um i would if that's a, a, a seriously such a big problem for the other owners i would consider calling a special general meeting to amend the conduct rules to allow for action like that um, in this particular body corporate better actual longer term solution while we anyway calling a special general meeting i would probably suggest um that the body corporate seriously consider the separate uh meter reading readings per unit because if this is the case in this one unit it, it's it, it's gonna happen somewhere else as well bruno please add to that because this is a weird problem i'll just threaten the owner and say i'm gonna turn off your water if you don't make a plan and then see if they get a script but that's illegal so don't do that <laughs> look so, <laughs> so i suppose the problem here comes down again to the constant dichotomy me and you face between legal advice and actual practical advice. So legally speaking, let's forget about the practical issues. Uh, there's a leak. It's causing damage to a lot of the tenants and the body corporate. And there's a specific portion of usage that shouldn't be attributable to anyone else. And because that exists, the argument is that the person that's causing this by not actually mitigating the loss and doing the repairs as they should be obliged to, uh, because you shouldn't have leaking pipes, especially if everyone shares in it, there's a level of damage, right? And you would theoretically be able to claim this damage from, from, from the tenant. So there's a damages component to this. Practically speaking, like Silna mentioned, it's going to be virtually impossible to know what it is because the ward, it's not... It, I mean, water water usage is by its very nature not standard every month. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to be able to tell exactly what scent went where. So that's going to be a very difficult thing to prove. So then you'd want to take it up a notch and say, well, let's let's find a way of actually doing something about it. And that comes to the question of are is the body corporate entitled to force a tenant, ah, force an owner to fix something or send someone there to fix it and claim the cost from the owner is the uh, is the body corporate entitled to actually gain access to the property and typically speaking you wouldn't be able to do any of this without a court order so practically make the threat do whatever you need to do but you're going to need to go to court I, and like we need to look at the rules so i don't remember the specific rules regarding conduct like this but if memory serves the body corporate does have power in situations where there's non-compliance with the rule or some sort of um, d damage or, or, or loss or the pain being suffered by the co body corporate to take action against an owner in order to rectify the position. So that would be what you'd rely on in order to be able to do this. But you wouldn't be able to just go kick down a door, send in a plumber and get it fixed. So practically speaking, you'd be looking at letters of demand. You'd be making a concession saying let's send in the plumber and let the body corporate cover it if for example they feel that you know what it's cheaper than having this fight or mm -hmm. pay it off over a period of time you know there's always like little concessions one could actually consider so think about it practically before you start speaking about legal rights which are far harder to enforce thanks Bruno. thanks a lot um i'm going to move on to a question that was asked by sue Sue wants to know, and this is something that we've dealt with previously uh, on, on our Wednesday webinars, but let's go into it. If a person's accommodation is linked to the employment contract and that person is dismissed, how do you get them to vacate the property if they are unwilling to do so? Would this require an eviction order? Now, we've dealt with this previously. I'm throwing it up in the air. Who's catching it first? You can deal with it. Yes. <laughs> We I thought I've spoken a lot today already, so I don't know if you want to take it. You want to well, take it Bruno, first, Bruno. I think the answer is 
yes. Like, like we've, had, <laughs> we've had questions like this. Do I need an eviction order for this? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. very simple. Um, Section 26 of the Constitution says that no person may be evicted or have their property demolished without a court ordering to do so after the relevant circumstances has been taken into consideration. Um, the reason for the illegal occupation, the reason for the original occupation, all of that is irrelevant. If somebody is in a property, illegally so, you need an eviction order um, to, get, uh, to get them out of the property. Which set of rules you're going to use uh, might differ. Commercial property, you're not going to use uh, the Prevention of Illegal Evictions Act. Um, you're going to go straight to court and ask for an eviction. If uh, in this case, the, the person was in occupation, and I assume it is residential, then you're going to use um, the, uh, the provisions of PI uh, to evict them. But you cannot evict anybody ever not because of COVID, not because of the national state of disaster, you cannot evict a person without a court order. Um, if somebody doesn't want to hand back possession willingly, and here's the key, and I'm leaving, only way of getting them out is uh, by court order. That was mm. clear. That was longer than just a yes. Yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> we should change the name of this group. I think like court like what eviction orders all is necessary because it's <laughs> it's it, 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 it's one of those questions that we keep getting but it's so true it's like guys you can't kick anyone out i think the only example we've ever spoken about where there was an eviction without a court order was obviously our chats to greg regarding um you know actors like you know the spoliation question of you know there's a squatter but he just like landed up on the property and you mm -hmm. kind of push him out and you tell him no 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 don't set up shop here but that's not occupation the guy hasn't mm -hmm. actually occupied the property so you're kind of pushing somebody out before they you know like put down their roots and that's mm -hmm. quite literally the only example that uh, you know, of eviction that doesn't require some form of court order or another. That's not to say, like Selma mentioned, there's different rules. So you can bring urgent eviction applications. I've done it before. You can get the eviction in a day if there's urgency. So it's not to say that you have to follow the same long process each and every time, even if... The, yeah, even if, like, the world's burning down, but it does require the court order. Uh, and just to, uh, also just to, to build on what uh, Solna was saying. So employment relationship, if terminated persons in occupation requires court order, uh, just a very, a very interesting point of conversation though, because we had a very similar case to this is uh, in our case, he was denying that the employment relationship was actually terminated. Uh, so he was having a labor dispute, took it to the CCMA, said that it was an unfair dismissal. And during that time, we were also in court with the eviction. And that started complicating things a little bit because the court for the eviction uh, considered the underlying reason for occupation as being the employment, which if disputed, and if it turns out that he wasn't, he was unfairly dismissed, would mean that his eviction would have been like unfair or unjust so th there guys be very careful like you kind of need to shift to the labor law side and start asking like but how strong is how strong was the dismissal did you do it properly is he actually dismissed is there a concession that he is because then then it becomes easier if not you might first need to like you know jump that through that hoop i think it's such uh, a valid point bruno because i've seen um i've seen quite a few of these issues like your your occupation is tied into your your employment mm. and the scary part and i think this is this is what we want to get out to to our viewers practical advice on this um if you do have that either if you are the employee and you you have a, a a place to stay which is arranged by the employer or if you are the employer and you are paying for people for accommodation Keep these things separate. Have a lease mm. agreement and have mm. an employment agreement. Um, I personally am um, <laughs> not a big fan of, of labor law. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very boring field of law for me. Um, I enjoy property law. I don't, I'm just, not going to repeat just, that. 
did, Jeff. He <laughs> <laughs> did. He did. No, I've seen that. <laughs> but um, yeah, I don't enjoy labor law. Um, but I think it's it's usually where, where problems come in because the moment you try and confuse those two fields of law, um, it's a massive disaster. So my advice always for clients is do a separate lease agreement um, and do a separate uh, employment contract and do not um, tie them into each other. It's something that you can do quite easily, uh, mm -hmm. but keep these two issues <laughs> separate mm -hmm. because like Bruno rightly says, Mm. Um, if there's then an issue about around the dismissal, it's going to blow up in your face. Mm. That's very good advice, actually. Yeah, thanks, Solna. Thanks, Bruno. Um, this next question here is quite interesting. It's for all the people who try their hand at golf and are unsuccessful. And I am one of those people. So sometimes I try to hit the ball in a certain direction and it does not go there. It actually goes into somebody's house. And I pray to God that I don't just hear sh the shattering of glass or a scream from the distance. But uh, I, thankfully I haven't had that. But that's, this, that's what this question is about. The question is, I live on a golf estate. Uh, my home appears to be constantly hit with golf balls. I can't even leave my house at certain hours and I'm, because I'm afraid to be struck by a ball. It says my dog has been struck by a ball. There have been windows that have been shattered. Uh, I believe that an unreasonable amount of balls are being, well, uh, are being hit and struck uh, and striking my home. Uh, and, and I feel like this home, where I, the hole that I live on, it needs to be redesigned. It's affecting my use and enjoyment of the property. What are my rights? Who wants to attend so, this so one? Do you want to take this one? Just because I'm the person that usually eats the ball. It, no, no, no. I've never, I, I've never hit a ball into somebody's yard. My, I don't, I don't hit that far. I mean, on 70 <laughs> meters. You, <laughs> you could just hit, it. you could just hit wide though. You don't have to, no. like, it doesn't have to be there. Your ball just needs to go skew. No, no, I eat dead straight, but like 20 meters if I'm lucky. <laughs> it's fun to play golf with me. But um, no, the answer is quite simple. Unfortunately, you choose uh, where you stay. It, if, if, however, if you bought this property and the golf estate was developed, the course was developed later, and you didn't know that you're on that unfortunate bar for with a very unfortunate dog leg. Um, and now the people, you know, the guys with the big drivers. Hit it. <laughs> I, I'm always amazed with you guys. How you can hit a ball so far away, we will never find it again. At least the girls sort of stay on the fairway. But <laughs> it, if it's one of those um, situations where you didn't know it before the time, fair enough, then, then um, you would have, as an owner, you would have been part of the decision-making process around the development of the golf course. If you then said, uh -uh, nia, 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 I don't want to be here, please put me on that easy um, hole, then you could have done that. Uh, that. That would have been the best time to do that. Currently, if you buy into a golf estate or a wildlife estate or an equestrian estate or whatever the case might be, this is the risks that you are now accepting. And you can't, after the fact, then say, no, but I didn't know the people hit this bad. Um, mm -hmm. I've once been on a golf day where uh, one of my four ball hit a ball straight into somebody's swimming pool. And I thought, do you still have to now play it? <laughs> but, <laughs> so it does happen. But if you buy into a, a place like that, it's almost like, uh, you buy into uh, a place like Zimbali or whatever, and then you very sad if there's like wildlife also uh, on 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 your property. So unfortunately, um, this uh, 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 this particular viewer, I can't, I can't see that there's any legal recourse um, for the unfortunate golf players um, on on that particular course. Uh, unfortunately, if you are un happy with the risks because of an estate and, and the specific things around that estate, um, my, my only suggestion would be um, to, to buy a, a property somewhere else. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's very true. Um, I, I, sure. 
Yeah. No, I was just going to say, Solna's given me more joy now because I can just keep playing without improving my game. I just feel like... <laughs> you, you do that. <laughs> Chris, we should go and play. <laughs> so here's an, interesting, here's an interesting question, Solna. So if you do hit the ball into somebody else's yard, can you compel them to open the door so you can hit it out back into the golf course? <laughs> That's what I want to know. And, or at least, I mean, you won't be able to play it. It will be out of bounds, but... Are you allowed to ask to get Put your ball, ball back? back? <laughs> because, I mean, we know what golf balls cost. I, I want my ball back. If I can see it in the swimming pool, I want it. But I don't right. think, I think they, the owner has a stronger right yeah. that you're not allowed to hop over the fence and go fetch the ball. So, only, only if you're a kid. Only if you're a kid. Then you're allowed to hop over and get any ball that you kick over. <laughs> <laughs> That's or at least it was like that when I grew up. So I don't know how, how it works now. I don't think it's legal, Bruno. I'm, I'm sorry. I don't want to. <laughs> no, don't let your kids jump over walls. <laughs> it's a pleasure. I just help your kids. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. It's a pleasure. Listen to Auntie Silma, not to Daddy. Yeah. <laughs> it is an alternative, um, though. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Bruno. Go ahead. I keep no, you no. taking Go ahead. You know, no, you're no, going to make so a legal I'm, point and I'm going to make a joke. So you should speak. <laughs> sure, fair. Um, no, but just a quick one. So on the, uh, sure. Uh, and this sounds very familiar, but now I can't for the life of me remember exactly how that case went. But um, I do recall there being a conversation around uh, like middle ground. So yes, a person bought into the estate. You cannot now all of a sudden try and interdict the playing of golf. That would be ridiculous. You wouldn't be able to stop this from happening. But I do recall conversations around, well, maybe circumstances have changed. Maybe there wasn't an awareness that certain things were possible. So, you know, certain things fell outside the norm. And now there's a realization that, you know, this could be somewhat dangerous. And I do remember them saying like things like netting, for instance, mm. and petitioning the the state or the, the or, you know, it's typically a state's home and association to put like, you know, protection. So you can't stop the, play, uh, the playing, but you can put up poles with nets and, you know, that sort of thing. Mm. Um, I just can't remember how that case actually played out, but I do remember that there was a conversation that was had in that case. So it's also something to think about. There are middle grounds. Yes, I, I, and I think that would be, in all these cases, the most reasonable solution. I mean, you can't demand that people no longer play that hole, but I mean, you can um, do that. Uh, if, if they say, for instance, want to put up a driving range that wasn't there, and you're the unlucky house next to the driving range, they definitely, I mean, you can even demand that they put up netting, but that's after the fact. If you buy into a place... Um, yeah, I think middle ground on a good day. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Bruno. Thanks, Solna. I think that brings us to the end of uh, today's webinar. Um, we ended off on a, on a nice light note there with golf. <laughs> I, I was going to say, the one, the one benefit to having these golf balls land in your yard, Solna, you're correct, they are very expensive, is that you could stand there in the garden with, and sell them <laughs> to the guys coming past. <laughs> We have lost balls. <laughs> so, so, I mean, listen, a broken window on the one hand, but money to fix it on the other. So you got a middle ground. <laughs> or, or even better, Chris, even better would be to pick them up and throw them back into the fairway and like just watch <laughs> the people being confused. Like, whoa, this is my ball. And I would, I'd be that person. <laughs> okay, we, we just lost five uh, viewers. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but thank you, Bruno. Thank you, Stolda. It's, it's such a pleasure to, to engage with you guys uh, on a weekly basis and, and today as well. I want to thank the viewers for joining us. Um, we will be going live next week at six o'clock. Please join us and, and, and post your questions. As always, we do say this. Please post your questions. If you have any legal questions around property, please post them in the group uh, or message us or contact Bruno or Sona directly uh, and we will definitely get back to you. But thank you so much. Have a great evening further. Thanks, Sona. Thanks, Bruno. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Thanks, Chris. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers.